Good morning, dear colleagues. Unfortunately, I could not be here with you in person, but I thank the organizers for allowing me to present my results through this recording. So I'll be talking about the DDA simulations for exciting sources inside the particle, and the plan is very simple. First, I will show how naive uh, ways can get you into failure, and then uh, I will try to correct and produce some reasonable results. Uh, so the discrete dipole approximation is a volume discretization method, so you can use it for orbital inhomogeneous particles. And important for the following is this equation, which uh, shows how the dipoles inside the particle connected to the incident field. And here you have this GIG, which actually can have different uh, formula expressions depending on the DDA formulation that we use. So we will discuss a few. Uh, when we place a point source inside the particle, uh, well, in, in general, we just need to change the incident field in the DDA, and that's potentially very interesting because there are a number of uh, applications, well, quasi-static ones like near-field radiative heat transfer and Casimir, computation of Casimir forces. Uh, so, well, let's just try and do it. And the first attempt, it actually fails miserably, as you see here, because um, we take a sphere, we place a dipole uh, polarized along zeta axis and move it along this axis, as shown here. And the result, well, it differs a lot between the formulations. So there are three formulations of the DDA here. I will discuss them later. All three of them basically give different results. Uh, when we get outside of the particle, then uh, apart from some oscillations, there is a convergence. So we can probably be sure in these results. But inside the particle, something bad is happening. So what can we say about it? Actually, in the literature, people have uh, seen uh, similar problems and have uh, devised some solutions or workarounds. And mostly they are related to, to, to computation of some correction factors, which can be used afterwards. So first we compute some wrong result, but then we can correct it by normalizing to some coefficient, which is um, usually determined through some lattice sums. Also recently um, at the Bremen conference, maybe you saw my talk, uh, I showed that uh, IGT formulation, which is integration of Green's tensor uh, over a volume of the cube or cuboid, it can uh, produce some meaningful results for that. So that's also kind of preliminary results. And the goal of all this work is to explain uh, what we can and what we can't do with sources inside the particle and how to uh, solve this scattering problem robustly and efficiently. And uh, yeah, just to let you know that for IGT, I will actually use the second order approximation, which is which described in this talk, but it's basically just, is computed fast and almost at the same accuracy. So you don't need to worry about it. Uh, the first important concept is the consistency of the DDA formulation. So it was shown some time ago, for example, in this paper, basically, if you consider a small sphere, then you know the solution inside it, how it should be. And if you plug it into the DDA equations, which is showed here where, where the plausibility is replaced with the diagonal term of uh, the interaction term, then we get some very simple sum rule, uh, which I will call further discrete consistency, shown here that we, if we sum the static green stands, a well specific formulation that we use uh, for the DDA over the whole grid, then we should get this uh, simple one third uh, term here. And this is actually not very interesting for cubical voxels because it's automatically satisfied for almost all formulations you can think of just based on the symmetry. But for example, it's very important for a rectangular cuboid voxel, but we won't discuss it here. Uh, then we go to the point source, and in general, well, as I showed, we just plug in the incident field of the point source inside the DDA, so the formula is shown here, but here I generalize it a little bit because I allow for different expressions of this green stanza. So it's kind of consistent that it, if we use some, uh, I don't know, filtered or averaged uh, green stanza in the interaction between the dipoles that we have in the DDA, then it, we should also use the same formulation for computing the incident field of the exciting dipole. So that this D means that it can have different formulations and three options are presented here. So it's either point dipoles where this is the standard uh, analytic green standard, the simplest one, 
Uh, then there are options for filtered coupled dipoles where we integrate it with some basically three-dimensional sync function for filtering, or we integrate it over the cube. And when we integrate over the cube, we also have here the basically indicator function of the volume. So that's kind of a generalization of the L term that we have in the DDA or delta function term. Uh, in general, we can use it also. So this, this is the expression that comes from the DDA formulation. So that means that the interaction of the dipole, which is GIJ, is just this expression, a natural one. But we usually use separate expressions for the diagonal terms. And that kind of indicates that there is some inconsistency going on here, except for IGT. So IGT is actually you just use it for any combination of dipoles, and that's a good sign. And then we can also show, I won't get into the details, but the idea is that, again, I use the same uh, simple analytic solution for a sphere, but now I put a point source inside sphere, and I know that the total dipole moment, which is induced, uh, which is original exciting one, plus the induced one, which is well defined here, uh, the induced one on the dipole gate, uh, it should uh, result in the known expression. And if I see here, I, from this, we can get the so-called continuous consistency, which means that now the sum of the green stanza, it should be not only between the grids, uh, the grid values, but if we put uh, one coordinate in any point, arbitrary uh, between the grid, and then sum over all other grid points, then again, we should get the same result. And this uh, continuous consistency, it's much more stringent than discrete consistency, which, is, which I was talking uh, before. And it's not automatically satisfied by many of the DDA formulas. So for IGT, it is satisfied. If we go to FCD, it's actually can be easily made to satisfy. And the correction, it just has the same self-term as we had in the IGT. And that's actually kind of a natural way to edit. And uh, it's strange that we did not have it before, but so we implement it in, in ADDA, and I will show you the results uh, later. Uh, because the FCD formulation actually satisfies another simple uh, sum rule independent of the position. There's also alternative expression but uh, that can be used, but I won't discuss it uh, in this talk. For the LDR, the problem is, again, quite a lot of formulas here, but important is that we have this uh, sum rule of the static, uh, simple static green stanza, and it will actually depend a lot on the position R inside the lattice. So that's uh, a problem. And then <clears throat> what we can do, well, we can compute the lattice sums, uh, but I have not yet done it inside the other code. But what we can do is uh, solve kind of incorrect problem, but then it will be like a problem for a different induced, for different exciting dipole moment, like here. And then I can correct for that. So it's the simplest case of Z-aligned uh, dipole. Um, I just need to come to divide the final result for emission enhancement, for example, by this factor, which can be computed independently. So that's what we tried. And uh, well, near fields which are needed for some application can also be corrected, but we have not played with that yet. So I performed some test simulations, which are uh, shown here, and let's uh, go exactly to the result. So that's, again, the same sphere as I showed before, but um, a, a bit more simulation. First, the IGT is the same as was used before, but FCD is now corrected by this self-term correction. LDI is post-corrected by division by the factor. And... Um, you see that here the results are already more or less satisfactory. So there is some trend and all formulations. Uh, seem there are some, well, these oscillations when we go from dipole to dipole. When we decrease the dipole size twice, so the number of dipoles per diameter and x uh, becomes twice larger, then this oscillation decrease. So again, we are quite sure in this result that are shown here. Then we also tried uh, odd values of uh, dipole uh, grid, which means that now this line will go almost through the center of the dipole. So before it was between the dipoles, not getting too close to the centers. Now it will go here, it will go almost along the centers. And that means that for LDR, for example, we will get very large values when the source gets near the dipoles. And we see that here the formulation breaks down, so even correction does not help afterwards. But between that, if we don't get too close, it's still the green line is more or less satisfactory as shown here. And again, the same uh, when we refine discretization, the same uh, good things happen. 
Also important to know that for FCD, it's overall smooth, but you clearly see this Gibbs phenomenon near the boundary and also, well, oscillations afterwards, which is somewhat strange. For LDR, so for point dipole after correction, it actually can be the best inside the particle. But again, on the boundary, IGT is probably the best one because it shows the sharp boundary as it should be from the boundary conditions. For the cube, the results are very similar. The overall trend is a bit different inside, but uh, like the simulation accuracy is the same. And then also I've tried uh, a particle which is much smaller than the wavelengths. And here, IGT is almost exact, apart from way near the boundary. Uh, LDR point dipole formulation is a bit worse. And FCD again have this uh, weird oscillation, but gets the overall trend, trend correct. So here we got to the conclusions that any continuously consistent formulation, it will converge to the two solutions. So in this respect, that would be a numerically exact uh, DDA solution for even for internal point sources. So that's uh, very desirable properties. If you, if you have only discretely continuous formulations, uh, then they can work fine for special source position, but you should exercise care for simulations. Uh, two of the formulations which are implemented in other, which is IGTSO and FCD, they are robust for arbitrary source position. So just go to the master branch of other, download, try it, you can do whatever simulations you want. Uh, point type of formulation can also be used with some post-correction, but not in all cases, as, as you saw. Uh, so that's it. And But it's also in interesting to mention a lot of future work. So some of it is just technical, not very interesting, but the most interesting is application of all these to some uh, practical uh, application. I mean, compute some physically reasonable or interesting results, and that's near-field relative heat transfer and Kazemi forces which is uh, actually my co-author or student, uh, Daniel and Alexander. Um, they are doing it right now, so hopefully they will present it in some uh, near future. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I want to acknowledge Patrick Schomer for pointing out papers on calculations with point dipole DDA. It was funded some time ago by Russian Science Foundation uh, when we started this work. And thanks for your attention.